Let me ask you a question about Israeli society and Israeli politics. You've been following this closely for 30 plus years. Um, the Israel of 1993, the Oslo peace process, the beginning of that process, is a different one than the Israel of today. Bill Clinton has spoken about this rather bluntly, uh, and he's spoken at, as a friend of Israel, but he's, he said, you know, look, you have uh, the religious nationalist bloc, the, the people who uh, are settlers and support the settlers. Um, you have um, the, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, who are growing as a, a larger part of the population. You have Mizrahim, the descendants of Jews who are refugees from Arab countries, who tend to lean, lean right. They're a very powerful bloc. And then you have the Russians, the recent Russian immigrants, uh, who came not as socialist as the first Jews 100 years ago, but as anti-socialists uh, after having lived through communism and, and don't seem to have much sympathy for the, um, the, what you and I might think of as the progressive Zionism of Tel Aviv. Um, is Israeli society now um, engineered in such a way as to make a two-state solution impossible or, or near impossible? You know, on any given day, it looks like that. Uh, but the, the reason why it's not the case is that there is no other solution than a two-state solution. I mean, the notions of one-state solution that are advanced by one state is on, on both sides, uh, don't, are not solutions. Why? They don't solve the problem. If, if Israel annexes the West Bank, it has two and a half million more uh, Palestinian Arabs in Israel. And that, everybody's heard this argument before, but it happens to be true that that will place the, the basic uh, Zionist vision of a, of a democratic Jewish state in jeopardy. Cannot be both if it, if it annexes the territories. Uh, because if it's democratic, then the Arabs will be a majority and, and it won't be a Jewish state. And if it's, if, if it's Jewish, then, then what rights will the Arabs have? It won't be democratic. Uh, so it, it leads Israel into, into a, an inevitability of a binational state. And that's why Prime Minister Netanyahu has said repeatedly, he does not want a binational state. He disagrees with the right wing annexationists in his own party on that point. Now, so it, it doesn't, you know, coming up with other ideas that relate either to, to uh, annexation or Palestinians demanding their rights within the state of Israel leads not to a solution, but to a continuation of the conflict. And so, therefore, notwithstanding all of the things that you cited, that reality doesn't go away. It doesn't get easier with time, but it doesn't go away. And what's interesting to me is the way in which, during the negotiations, you already saw the first signs of, of uh, something shifting. Uh, Yvette Lieberman, the foreign minister, uh, heads up a, a, a primarily Russian-based party that's joined with the Likud in the government, uh, positioned himself to the left of Netanyahu. He was the first to come out and say, I support the Kerry plan, and it's the best thing we can get, and we should support it. There wasn't even a Kerry plan at the point at which he <laughs> supported it. So he was purposely positioning himself in the centre. And since then, he's announced his own peace initiative. In the midst of all of this, these trends, these negative trends, the foreign minister, who is recognised universally as a real hardliner, is talking the language of two-state solution. And I think next month we'll probably come out with some initiative. How come? He's the smartest politician in Israel. He must be sensing something, notwithstanding everything you said. He must be sensing that... <coughs> There is a constituency in the center, obviously it's on the left, but in the center that he's appealing to by talking about peace. And lo and behold, Yair Lapid, the leader of the centrist uh, Yeshatid party, uh, with its, what is it, 19 seats? I mean, it's a major uh, member of the coalition who was silent during the nine months of the negotiations barely found his voice on the issue of peace, essentially because he thought 
dissenter was much more interested in his agenda of social values rather than peace, now is in full-throated support uh, of peace and full-throated opposition to settlement activity. So what is it that these politicians, in the midst of a breakdown, when everybody else thinks it's hopeless, why are they speaking in this way? So you way? believe they still sense, even in these harder constituencies, they still sense uh, a, a grasp on that two-state reality? Some sort. That, that there is no other solution, and that Israelis have to find a way. 